And today we're going to deal specifically with the issue of delayed healing. What should I do when my healing is delayed? Today, we'll focus on recapping the basics of salvation. In the next video, what we'll be looking at is what causes delay. And of course, the last video would be how to deal with delay. And so to get into this topic, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 3 to verse 19 because there Paul gives us a list of some basics of salvation. And so Paul begins in Ephesians chapter, chapter 1 and we will pick it up in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And right there, Paul hits us with a big revelation. The revelation is that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. God is not going to bless us. He has already blessed us, not with some, but with all spiritual blessings. So we need to see ourselves as already given everything we need by God. We don't need to ask God to consider giving us things. He has already thought about it and he has already given us everything. He has blessed us with all spiritual. Spiritual blessings means the blessings come by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who brings it up. Okay, this is the revelation Paul it says with immediately we have already been blessed with all blessings, all spiritual blessings. And we need to see ourselves like that. We are already blessed. We are not trying to be blessed. We are already blessed. But he doesn't stop there. He begins to list what these spiritual blessings are in the verses hereafter. Beginning in verse 4. We are chosen. And that's very interesting. The word chosen means to pick out. It means to choose for one's self. And that means because God, when you read 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible tells us that based on God's foreknowledge, He chooses people. That means some people are not chosen. This is the first spiritual blessing, Paulus. You are chosen. You are selected. And that's amazing when you think about it. In, we did a video, and I would invite you to go into the YouTube archives in this channel. We did a video on Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, where we explained what election is about, what it means to be chosen. Another word for chosen is election. And so I would invite you to look at that, that, that video to get and understand it. But the point here is that God has chosen you. He didn't choose everybody, he chose you, and that's mind-boggling. He didn't choose you because of what you did or didn't do, because he chose you before you were born. That's what the scripture says, before the foundation of the world. God foresaw, he had foreknowledge, and based on his foreknowledge, he saw you, and he chose you. So I want to ask you this question. If you, if you are married and you have a spouse, and you're married for a few years and you have gone through the challenges, the problems. If before you were married, you had foreknowledge of how the marriage would be like and how this person you are getting married to will act and operate and all the arguments and all the issues and, and everything that is not pleasant. If you had foreknowledge of that, would you still choose to marry that person? The amazing thing is God foresaw you he foresaw all his sins, he foresaw all the weaknesses, he foresaw all the issues that he would have in trying to get you to experience the blessings of his will. He foresaw all of the weaknesses, the failures, the outright sins, over and over, repetitive failing, and he still chose you. So if God could see all that and still choose you, then why is it that you condemn yourself? When you do something that is not right, you disobey God. That doesn't surprise God because he already knew that you will do that. But what happens is many of us condemn ourselves and we say to ourselves, how could I do that again? This is the millionth time I did that. God knew that. And this is the amazing thing. God still chose to have relationship with you. 
so you don't condemn yourself don't think of yourself less than because you failed in certain areas and do not consider yourself to be a failure because you are not a failure god in his foreknowledge saw everything that you would ever do and he has already put things in place to still help you come up to where he wants you he still chose you and then he goes on in in, in, in verse 5 we are predestinated predestination means to determine or to decide beforehand God decided before you were even born, before the world was ever created, that you would be his child. The best way we could have described that is like a husband and wife expecting a child. The, the, the wife is pregnant, so she's expecting a child. Because these parents know a child is coming, they would pre-plan everything as best as they could for that child. The, as much as they could plan, they would plan. And it would be planning in advance. And that is what predestination means. But what it, predestination goes even deeper because God could foresee events. He could foresee the future. And so predestination means God plans in advance for you. God foresaw every mistake you would ever make. He foresaw every sin you, could, you would ever commit. He foresaw all your weaknesses. He foresaw everything, good and bad. And the amazing thing is he still chose you. But not only that, he planned everything out in advance. He put things in place along the, 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 your timeline, your life, so that you could use what he puts in place at that time for the issue that you have. So if you fail and if you sin, don't get frustrated with yourself. God foresaw that and he put plans in place to deal with those failures, to help you to get back on track. They put things in place to help you to get back into His will and to enjoy His blessing. What we need to do is to pursue that relationship with Him and the Holy Spirit so we could follow Him and we could get back on track. But don't condemn yourself because He doesn't condemn you. He foresaw all that failure and He still chose you and He planned for it. We just need to use, follow his, his direction by his word. Use what he puts in place for us and we will get back on track. Because remember, he's a good God. He planned to have us as children. And, and verse 5 says that this is the good pleasure of his will. God has only good thoughts about you. I don't know how many of us remember, but in the Old Testament, when Balaam called uh, Balak called Balaam to curse Israel, he couldn't curse Israel because God turned what he wanted to say into blessings. And every time he went to curse Israel, God turned it into a blessing. But what is interesting about that is prior to that event with Balak and Balaam, Israel was murmuring. They were sinning. God was angry with them. But when someone came to curse them, everything always turned out into a blessing. And that's something that is interesting, is how God sees us. Our actions may not always line up with what He wants, but you are His child. And He is well pleased to have a relationship with you. It is the good pleasure of his will when you come into the mind of god he doesn't think about you with anger and frustration he has pleasant thoughts he is happy when you come into his thoughts in the bible in the old testament it says he wrote your name in the palm of his hand because he is it is his pleasure to think about you so if you fail and if you falter you don't condemn yourself because your heavenly father does not condemn you and so the, 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 he goes on and he says in verse 6, the word accepted there is very interesting. In the original Greek, it means to highly honor or greatly favor. It means to shower your grace on a person. And what God did is that he, that's exactly what he did. He showered or he lavished his grace on us. And that's what grace is. It is God's goodness. It is God's favor. It's also grace is also power. It's a principle. It's the power of God operating in our lives. 
But God lavished that on you. You don't need to beg God for grace. God already freely gave that to you. What you need to do is to learn how to access it, how to receive it, and how to let that grace flow, function in your life. The thing about us as believers is we are not people who are trying to get God to do things for us. We are people who should be enforcing what God has already done for us and what he has already given to us in our lives. Basically, like if you're in a river or a sea and you jump into the water and then you are in the water, that's how you are. Grace is just all around you and saturating you. But for it to work, the first thing you need to do is to begin to think of yourself like that because that is how God sees you. He lavished his grace on you. In this chapter 1, of Ephesians and in, and in the other chapters of this book of Ephesians, the repeated phrase that we find is just two words, in him, or sometimes you will see in Christ. And that's the, the key thing in the book of Ephesians. You could probably say that there's a key the theme of Ephesians. It is in him. Everything that this chapter lists as the spiritual blessings that we have in heavenly places, we have it because we are in Him. We are in Christ. What does it mean to be in Him? What does it mean to be in Christ? Basically, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21 tells us that. Verse 21 says, He, that is Jesus, became sin, even though He knew no sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. And that is what it means to be in Christ. It means... He took what we deserve and we receive what He deserves. And today we enjoy all the benefits of His obedience and His perfections. When God sees us, God sees us through the lens of Jesus. So because Jesus is perfect, God sees us as perfect. Now our actions our our lives may not be perfect yet but the image that is on the inside of us is perfect god sees us through the through his son jesus who is perfect and therefore god does not pronounce any curse or condemnation on us there the benefit is that we have redemption. The things that we spoke about in the previous verses are the things God did for us in, the, in ages past, before the foundation of the world. But from now on, we'll be talking about things God did for us now, the minute we are born again. This is some of the spiritual blessings. The first thing is we have redemption. The word redemption means releasing someone by the payment of a ransom redemption also means deliverance so redemption means that you are already delivered from all of the power the whole and the consequences of sin you are not trying to become free you are already free and that is where sickness we need to bring in sickness God pre-planned or he predestinated your life and he never planned for you to be sick. And when Jesus died and we believed in him, we were redeemed. And that means we were delivered from these things. Jesus has already delivered you from depression, frustration and sicknesses. So if he did it, then why are we still sick? Why is it that we still have mental issues? Some believers still have all kinds of challenges um, medically, mentally, emotionally, and so on. And the reason, the main reason is because many of us have not learned how to access what he has given to us and put it to work. And we could use the, the, the Israelites, the Israel people in the Old Testament God told them, I, I have already given you the land. But they took years before they, they, they actually took possession of the land. God did that for us already. But we need to learn how to access, for example, the healing. How to access the healing 
and then force it in our lives. And we'll be talking about that some more. But we are redeemed. And we are redeemed by his blood. That's very interesting. Verse 9 says, Everything that we speak about flows from God's purpose. And his purpose for you does not include sickness. And you have to think of yourself like that. That's the basis of your relationship with God. He has no purpose including sickness for you. The fact, verse 11 says, In whom we have obtained an inheritance. We have an inheritance, the scripture says, in him. And so that inheritance is what we need. First of all, we need to understand what is this inheritance. What we need as believers to, is to get that revelation into what is our inheritance and how do we access it so we can enjoy it. That's what our Christian life is about, is renewing our minds understanding what we have and how to put it to work. Not only that, but verse 13 says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The word seal means to secure. It's like in the, what they used to do is to have a stamp and the stamps up like, like a signet ring. They use the ring and stamp a document or stamp something to preserve it or to keep it secure. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. He is the seal, or in other words, the Holy Spirit in us it gives us the security here and hereafter. Because the Holy Spirit of God is the down payment right now. And the fact that He is in us is the guarantee that we will experience the fullness of everything God has for us. So the Holy Spirit is a guarantee or a down payment or this verse, it uses the word seal, which means he is the one who secures us. He preserves us because he is in us. We are secured and preserved in this life and also in the life to come. Why am I still sick when he has already delivered me from sickness? The key thing, Paul says it here in verse 17, the prayer Paul prayed for the church was that they would have wisdom and revelation in their knowledge of God. In other words, he didn't only want them to know God. Or to, to know there means relationship. It means intimate knowledge of God. But it's not just head knowledge. He wanted them to have revelation and wisdom. Head knowledge will just make us proud. Revelation is what will build us up on the inside and help us to experience all that we know. So if I know Jesus has delivered me from sickness, how do I walk in that? The very first step is to get revelation from God. What does healing mean? And then I need wisdom to know how to access that healing and put it to work. But here what he says, he prayed that they would have revelation in three main areas. And that is in verse uh, 18 and 19. The first one, hope of their calling means, the word calling there in the Greek, it means an invitation. God gave us an invitation to come into relationship with him and enjoy that relationship now and hereafter, after this life. But that invitation into relationship with him and to enjoy all that he has purposed to do, it has a hope with it. Another, way we, another word we could use for hope is expectation. When the Bible uses the word hope, it doesn't mean that we something may or may not happen. Hope in the Bible actually means that it will happen. And so we are expecting it to. So what Paul says is, I'm praying that you will get a revelation in what you should expect to see in your life. Help me to understand that and give me a revelation in what I should expect what do I have to enjoy? You know, help me to see what's the big deal about this. And then give me a revelation in my inheritance. The word inheritance means a possession. 
your heritage, what you have. You need to know what it is so you could appreciate it. And so you pray, God, give me revelation. What is my inheritance? And when you have that revelation, you will know that healing is, is, is yours. And the last thing is to pray that it, you understand the power of God that is released in your life. The word power, there is dunamis. And it means power to produce change. The power to achieve things, to cause change, to do work. This, this verse, if you read later down in this chapter, it says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and set him to be the head over the church is the same power in you. It's operating in you. So if that power is in you, why are you sick? Why is because what Paul is saying, you need to get revelation. And so we need to get revelation in the hope of our calling, our inheritance, and the power that God gives us. That verse ends in the revelation or the power is in us who believe. The word believe there, that's verse 19, is in the present tense, which means we have to continuously believe this. And that is the thing. We need revelation and we need to believe. But we get revelation, we need to believe that revelation. Let's just summarize this. Everything we would ever need, including healing, is already finished because of Jesus' death. Today, we are enforcers of his finished work. And this includes enforcing our own healing. We are enforcers of everything Jesus has already done for us. It is ours, but we need to enforce it. And so we will stop here in this video. Because I want to invite you, listen to this again. Read this chapter for yourself. Study this chapter. The book of Ephesians is a great book to study. But study this chapter over and over. And get an understanding in the basics of salvation. I'm hoping that this is a help to you. We still have two other videos to do to answer this question. The other video will be talking about why delays in our healing happens. And if delay does happen, how to deal with it. So we can get the healing that we deserve. Until the next video. I pray God's blessings on you and look out for the next video where we will continue in this topic about healing. And take care and God bless.